Welcome to worship as we prepare and anticipate the birth of our Lord anew in our lives and into our world. I am Reverend Rebecca Luter, the pastor at Farmington Presbyterian, and we pray that you would know God's presence with you wherever you are in this time of worship. Even when we can't gather in person, Emmanuel, God, is with us. Even when some Christmas traditions have to go, Emmanuel, God is with us. Even when we can't sing carols beside each other, Emmanuel, God is with us. If you are worshiping at 11 o'clock on Sunday, I invite you to greet one another in the chat with God be with you. For indeed, Emmanuel, God is with us. We watch and wait for Christ's coming, lighting candles of hope and peace, joy and love, remembering the promises of God with prayer. Hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. You who bring good news, lift up your voice with a shout. Say, here is your God. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and gathers and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. God so loved the world that he humbled himself to be born to us. When we hear the familiar story of the birth of Christ with the angels and the shepherds and the wise men, let us not forget that this is how God showed us love among us. He sent his, his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. We light the first candle of Advent, the candle of hope, recalling the hope that we have in Christ, the light of the world, who banishes the darkness of our world. 
we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace, awaiting the Prince of Peace who restores the peace of God's kingdom. We light the third candle of Advent, the candle of joy, rejoicing in his salvation, for unto us a child is born. Today we light the fourth candle of Advent, the candle of love. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Let us pray. Eternal God, you love us more than we can imagine. You give us more than we can think to ask. You care for us more gently than a mother cares for her newborn. You come to us in ways that are beyond our understanding. Prepare our hearts to welcome you anew. Teach us to love you as you love. Amen. God is witness to our lives, the one who sees all we do and fail to do, the one who hears what we say and what we don't. God is also the one who forgives us, cleanses us, and dwells with us. Let us draw near to God as we confess our sins together. God of love, all year long we pursue power and money, yet you came in weakness as an infant. As we lament this year the loss of shopping and hustle and bustle, you alone offer what is lasting that cannot be purchased. Forgive us, heal us, correct us. When we allow darkness to overcome the light, forgive us, Lord. When we reduce Christmas to gifts and food, have mercy on us, Christ. Forgive our lack of faith and trust, our lack of vision and action that we may watch and wait and once more welcome our Savior home in our hearts.
God's tender mercy rests on you, heals you, transforms you. God's light breaks into our lives like light on the horizon, showing us the way. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and reconciled, renewed and made whole. See the path that God has prepared for us, the way of hope, the way of peace, the way of joyful grace, the way of loving service. Glory to God. Amen. As God's forgiven and reconciled children, let us together declare what it is we believe using our affirmation of faith. We believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, the one who is full of patience, who is not afraid of silence, who does not need to fill each moment with activity and noise, the one who is beyond bluster and flurry, and who does not jostle for attention. We believe in God the Son, Savior of creation, who slipped into Bethlehem one night, mostly unnoticed, who lived 30 years without headlines or hurry, who frequently took time alone with his patient father, who waited for the right time to become the suffering servant, who stood quietly before the noise of his accusers, whose silence overpowered their words, who died, then rose again on a quiet Sunday morning. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens, empowers, renews, and refreshes, sometimes arriving with obvious power, sometimes with the quiet breath of a whisper. We believe in one God, who patiently waits for us, and who longs for us to do the same. Our Lord said that this is the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In that kingdom, the most humble, who are the most like children, are the greatest. Let us look at our scripture this morning through the eyes of children. Darkness. Did you know that there are caves all around the world that people go to explore? And it's so dark, you can barely see your nose in front of your face. And then all someone has to do is strike a match and suddenly the room is lit up. It just takes a little bit of light from a tiny match to drive away the darkness. In the Bible, we call sin darkness. The world is full of sin. And that is why Jesus came into the world, to drive out the darkness, to drive out the sin from our lives. Jesus is a baby that we celebrate at this time of year. But that little baby, he was a gift to the world, grew up. He grew up and became a man. He worked in a carpenter shop. He made friends. He preached the word. He came to drive out the darkness of the world. At Christmas time, we see all these wonderful lights all around our neighborhoods, on our trees, maybe even in the front of our own home. All of those lights are there, not just to be a pretty display, but as a reminder, in the darkness, there is a light that is coming to pierce through even the deepest of night, to give us hope, and a reason to remember the love that was born in a manger. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for the gift of light. 
Thank you for the gift of your son who came to us as a little bitty baby who grew into a man who drove out the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's children said, Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, your word is not distant, your love is not rationed, your grace is at hand, for you are present with your people as we call upon you. You are our heavenly Father, revealed through Jesus Christ, your Son, and we have come to delight in your word and be transformed by your love. Our first reading today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 1 through 9. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands would put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading this morning comes to us from John's Gospel, the first chapter, verses 1 through 14. Listen now for the word of the Lord. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every human being was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When you step into the Gospel of John, you realize that you have left the street noise behind and entered a home that is well thought out, filled with light, poetic with sleek design, with accents placed to draw your attention, 
And yet, at the same time that it feels like you've just walked into a piece of art, you feel remarkably comfortable. Welcome to the organic architecture of John's Gospel. While Mark constructed a small one-room cottage with a potbelly stove at the center, focusing the reader on the death and resurrection of Jesus, and Luke welcomes us to his farmhouse with a wide porch and plans to take us room by room by room throughout the whole house, every room decorated beautifully, story after story, pointing out the real treasures and giving the backstory on the furnishings. Matthew opens the doors of a neoclassical stone mansion imposing outside with portraits of generation after generation lining the stairwell to the dazzling ballroom, radiant and aglow with people who have traveled from the far ends of the earth to be here for this glorious occasion. John's gospel rises from the landscape and at the same time is distinct from it and one with it. John's goal is not so much to tell the story of Jesus as it is to explain the significance of the story of Jesus. And the first thing the reader needs to know is that this is not a new story. John begins with the first words of Hebrew scripture. In the beginning. In the beginning, God created and in the beginning was the word. If you visit a home designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, who is a master of organic architecture, you will have difficulty walking right up to the front door. He intentionally hid the front doors of his homes, especially the Usonian ones found in cities, from casual approach. Likewise, John's prologue winds purposefully in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The good news doesn't start in Bethlehem. The good news starts when the earth was a formless void. God was, and God spoke. Let there be light. From the very beginning, God willed the darkness back by bringing forth light. In him was life, and the life was the light of all. And now the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. Creation and redemption are inextricably linked, woven together. God formed humankind out of the ground and in God's image, and breathed into us the breath of life. And now the breath of life takes on terra firma, taking nothing away from God's image, and lives among us. Arrhenius, one of the early church leaders who lived and wrote about 50 years after the Gospel of John was written, wrote this, God became what we are in order to make us what God is. Hear that again. God became what we are in order to make us what God is. Reverend Dr. Cynthia Campbell puts it this way, the word became us, flesh and blood, so that we might become what we were meant to be. The incarnation, Christ born to us, is for our transformation. In him was life. In him is our life. He was filled with grace and with truth. Now that's a divine tension. He was filled with a tension of grace 
and truth. And it is that tension in which our life reverberates, our song is sung, that is our meaning. He was filled with grace. What is grace? God's love that we do not and cannot deserve. He was filled with truth. What is truth? God's omniscient, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-wise reality. He was filled with grace and with truth. And in that divine tension is our life. Now, once you've entered the front door of a Frank Lloyd Wright home, you are aware at once of the quiet and the light. Wright built the facade of his urban homes with a tall, solid wall to block the noise of the outside world, and he curtained the back of his homes with glass, allowing the light to stream in, allowing the walls, the home's walls and furnishings seemingly to naturally flow with the nature outside and around. His prairie homes mimicked the lines and colors of the prairie on which they were built. Organic architecture marries art and nature. One of his most famous homes, Falling Water, blends into the wooded mountains around it at the same time that its terraces imitate and accentuate nature's waterfall on which it sits. Now here is the reality. Falling water's cantilevered terraces have been sinking and cracking since the day the concrete was poured. Over and over again, they have been repaired and reinforced. We are not different. Our structural integrity needs to be regularly analyzed We sink, we sag, we need restoration. And yet, structural engineers have accomplished amazing feats of engineering to embed steel cable beneath the surface of the walls and the floors deep inside falling water. And we who receive him, the Christ child, Receive the power to be children of God, to be restored. We are meant to be organic architecture, connected so deeply with Christ that we blend into his nature and emulate his grace and truth. For in him is life and the light of us all. Amen. As we turn to God in prayer, if there are concerns on your heart and mind today, I encourage you to share those in the chat if you're worshiping with us at 11 o'clock, or to email them to us at church at farmingtonpres.org so that we can be in prayer with you. This morning, especially, I want to lift up that Rhonda Burns' mother, Linda, is in her last days on hospice care, and we do pray for all of Rhonda's family. Let us turn now to God in prayer. Inspiring word, move over the chaos in our world. Call forth form and order. As we prepare for your coming anew in our lives and our world, help us discern the places where you are coming to repair your good but broken creation. Illuminating word, pierce the darkness in our world. Call forth insight and understanding. Help us trust that your future is struggling toward realization even now in our midst. Incarnate word, indwell us. Call forth passion and purpose. Help us see ourselves and others as bearers of your image. Where there is brokenness, darkness, silence, empower us to repair, 
to be light, to speak your hope into being, into your love and healing, we commend those who serve selflessly, those who are deployed to protect and guard, those who are deployed to respond to emergencies, those who are deployed to offer intensive care. And we commend those who are sick, especially we lift to you Rhonda's mother, Linda, Lord God, we commend to you those who are grieving losses, loss of loved ones, loss of health, of income, loss of treasured traditions and gatherings. Holy Spirit, descend to us. Be born in us that we may know you in our living and embody you for the world, full of grace and truth. For we pray in the name of the one whom you sent because you so loved the world, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Trusting in the sure promises of Christ, and grateful for the Spirit's sustaining power, let us offer our tithes, offerings, and lives to God that we may be part of what God is doing in the world even now as we watch for Christ coming in glory. Join me in our prayer of dedication. We commit to holding the radical hope of Jesus, transforming darkness in ordinary and extraordinary ways, living as Christ's body here on earth, and giving our prayers, time, and resources to shine his light. Amen.
As the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the church at Philippi, the Lord is near. We are witnesses of the dawning of that great light come into the world. Emmanuel, God with us. May we depart from this gathering with our faces set to the sun so that our lives may serve as a reflection of God's light in the midst of our darkness, that our very lives may announce the coming of the Messiah. Amen.